It's a great pleasure to be here, and I think I can describe in a few phrases his description of my interest. I'm a little bit like an oil slick, 100 miles wide and about a molecule thick, although in, in some areas maybe a couple of molecules thick. And I, was, I actually packed carefully to come on this trip, and then I had a moment of fear this morning in the cab from the hotel to here. I packed this shirt partially because it's kind of a nice summery shirt, but also I thought, well, orange, that's uh, University of Miami has that color. And then in the cab, I thought, oh my god, is that Florida State? Is that the University of Florida? Am I going to have to go back and put on a t-shirt or something? And then I saw the sign of the health center. I said, oh yeah, OK, fine, I'm all right. So I'm going to give a talk, not technical, or at least I hope it won't be, that it will be trying to show some things in this specific application of ranking and ensemble estimation. And I don't think I'll actually get to the and part, but we'll see. So part of it is the specific goal of, of ranking. And part of it is a little bit of an advertisement, if you'd like, for Bayesian thinking and Bayesian formulation. And that's very different from being a personal Bayesian. But to push the idea that the Bayesian formalism is extremely effective at first of all, formulating what you'd like to do and then being able to do it, irrespective of whether you later want to make sure it has good frequentist properties, Bayesian properties, or whatever. It's just a nice conceptual framework, irrespective of your statistical philosophy. So let's not preamble. Ranking, and I've, some of these are quotes from a while ago, is just in the news all over the place. You have these 10 worst, best, and worst pronouncements, whether it be healthcare providers, schools, the hot geographic areas where disease is high, so on and so forth. And in a lot of cases, either rewards and penalties are being, uh, being uh, imposed, or follow-up in the lab is being done that might be expensive for the highest, highest ranking SNPs or genes or whatever it might be. Or quite frankly, there are situations with schools that may be reputational, not so much financial in the direct sense. So doing it poorly, can have very big consequences. And actually, doing it well is in general very difficult, not in the sense of producing the estimates, but in having things that are actually stable and, and quite believable. So the theme of this is to do it well and also to couple the doing it well with appropriate measures of uncertainty. I guess that means I'm a statistician. These league tables, these are from 2003, but England had been doing a lot of these value-added modeling things. I did a bit of that at RAND, where you measure how much knowledge you inject into these students every year, and then you give credit to teachers and schools or discredit to teachers and schools. It's a ranking exercise, eventually. Letterman's top 10 list. I'm just trying to make this a little bit fun. New York Times, several years ago, had a headline, New York's most deadly cardiac surgeons. And some of the ones with point estimates that were up there looking deadly was, might have been true, but they were based on very few cases. And so it might have just been random variation. And in fact, regression to the mean solved their reputation the next year and that they came back down. But a lot of places where there's this ranking implicit. Uh, I decided to be modest and not update it. But apparently, well, actually, a week ago, we found out it's also still true what was true in 2008, 9, 10, and indeed in 11. There are some places where you don't want uncertainty estimates at all. You just want to be able to say, hey, Hopkins is ranked by US and World Report as the best school of public health. We might want to decide how they do the ranking and so on. But in this case, I think we just want to leave it alone and say that it's a very valid statement. Uh, I'm going to leave out a few of this stuff and just move to the a motivating application, but you could translate this to the gene environment or any other situations. But the application I'll use for at least one theme is this, I, this thing that goes on every year with the renal dialysis program, and that is to keep score on, on dialysis centers in terms of lots of things, but in this case, standardized mortality ratios, which are the ratio of observed deaths over expected deaths. And I'm putting, I put those two things in red both to highlight that they're the ratio, but also I'm going to grant that the expecteds are computed well. And the expecteds are done by, generally, a very complicated case mix adjustment. And so it's actually the case that if you do that poorly, anything I'm going to talk about is almost second order compared to having done the balancing of the books correctly. But for today, we're going to set that aside as being almost too interesting. And the observes I put in red because, at least in this application and many others, 
ascribing a death in this case to a certain center is not automatic. People get transferred to transplant, so on and so forth. HICFA, or excuse me, CMS has lots of rules on how to ascribe events to different centers. Again, we're brushing all of that aside, or at least setting it aside, to focus on the more statistical issue. Uh, the main issue in terms of doing a good job on ordering these things is that the expecteds are quite variable. I don't mean that they have a statistical variation, but that they vary from center to center. So you've got some precise estimates, some not so precise, and the challenge is how do you broker the signal and noise appropriately? Well, ranking is easy. I mean, we've all done it, and I'm going to do it in the next slide with three numbers, so it's not even a heavy computational load. Uh, with those SMRs, to start with, you can take the point estimates, and there are 3,459, 3, I think it is. Here, I've just taken the point estimates and ranked every 45th of them, I think. This is, there are not 3,000 or so dots on there. Ranking's easy. There are the maximum likelihood estimates, and what I mean by that in this case is just these uh, O's over E's, and so there they are. Uh, it's very easy, and this is just the small version of it, and that is you get these numbers and you rank them like that, with smallest being the one and so on and so forth. If you want to convert to percentiles, which I do frequently just to get away from whether the total number of units is 60 or 93 or so on, you know, by certain percentiling rules you get this. So it's easy, you just do it. But the issues are that you don't, you're not really ranking the true SMRs, you're ranking their estimates. And so it might be better to try to put this in a framework where you say, I'd love to rank the true SMRs, I don't have them, I have a noisy estimate of them, and so maybe if I embed this in a hierarchical model where I get, let the statistical procedure give me a posterior distribution on the truth and then use that somehow to be the best ranking, that I'll do better, and that's, that's the theme here. Ranking is difficult because you actually need to trade off signal and noise if you have differential variability. So here's that same plot of two slides ago, but now I've put on it the, actually the exact Poisson confidence limits, not large sample. So you can see there are several centers here, and again, it's just every 45th in the order, that had no deaths. Some of them are more stable zeros than others, they have a bigger denominator, but compared to just looking at the dots, all of a sudden you realize, you know, maybe this isn't as simple as I thought it was. A lot of these zeros might actually be way over here. Some of these might be here, some back here. It's very hard for me to know by hand how to do this trade-off between signal and noise, and that's why the formalism, at least from my point of view, helps a great deal. So <coughs> The ranking challenge is a little bit like the Goldilocks challenge, and that is if you do what has been done in the past, and I think it's, it's not really being done so much anymore because a lot of people, myself included, but many others are showing why you need to do something better. If you just rank maximum likelihood estimates or other things you would call the estimate, it's intuitively clear that the highly variable ones will tend to be on the edges and the less variable ones in the center, even if, in fact, all of these clinics are operating in about the same way. And you get the opposite thing with what was traditionally done, and you could say this completely still done almost always for SNPs and genes and so on, and that is if instead you test the hypothesis of this unit being just like all the others and then rank those z-scores or p-values, you get just the opposite. You get the stable ones out on the edges, and the less stable ones inside because the power is higher for the, for the more stable ones. So you need to somehow have a, a trade-off routine that is at least principled in the sense that you can discuss what you're doing. And then I think the big however is even if you do that well, you'll see as I go along that uncertainty dominates this stuff and you want to make sure to communicate that and, and use it as part of what you, what you do. So this is just a quick example that maybe you don't need, but at least emphasizes in this application this too hot, too cold kind of thing. So this is a table, I probably could have made it a graph, but it is ranking the MLEs. And I've, the rows have to do with the size of the provider, which links up very closely with the number of, with the expecteds and with the stability of the estimate. And 
so we're counting now how many are in the lower 25% of these, middle 50, upper 25%. So if I did the margin down here, it would be 25%, 50%, 75%. And as you can see, the highly variable ones tend to be on the edge. The lowly variable ones, if I may use that, tend to be in the center. And yes, there may be some truth to that in that maybe they are some that are actually high and low. But if you go to the next table that's just the same, except now I'm doing it with the z-score approach, same clinics are in these rows, but now you get just the opposite, that the, the highly variable ones, the small sample size ones, tend to not ring the bell, and the larger sample size ones tend to. So the Bayesian structuring of this, as you'll see, and that's different from Bayesian philosophy, and I, we can talk at lunch, or you've all had your lunch, about whether I'm a philosophical Bayesian or just a practical Bayesian. And I suppose the answer is a little bit of yes for the first and a lot of yes for the second, is to develop a hierarchical model or a multi-level model, once you've done that, use the rules of probability to do the computations you need to do. It takes a little of this CPU, a lot of that CPU, but we've got that one these days, and I'm losing this one fast, but at least I still have a bit of it. Uh, why do I, I always like to put frowny faces and smiley faces on things that are difficult. The frown is it's difficult, and the smile is it's job security, so that it's nice to have things that are still difficult conceptually and computationally to keep us going. Okay, let's get a little bit formal but almost no more formal than this. The basic hierarchical model I'm going to deal, deal with, and you can generalize this to have all sorts of fancy things, is that the true underlying SMRs or log SMRs or gene expression or whatever it might be are unique but are connected in the sense that they come from some prior distribution. That prior distribution is specified by a parameter or parameters eta, and you can Think of this as allowing for it to be a Gaussian prior or a completely non-parametric prior where eta just says it's something. Conditional on the, in this case, the log SMR for a given unit, what you get to see are the deaths. And they will follow some sampling distribution, this piece being very exactly the same as a frequentist would do. In our case, it's going to be Poisson, but it's whatever it is. And if we're being Bayesian about the whole thing, we'll put a another structure on here to say we don't know eta and that's uncertain, but the guts of what I want to do today is this two-stage model where we're gonna use the y's to inform us on the posterior distribution of the thetas and then do something with it. So, just, I'm not giving a lecture on computing, but the core of a, of a wind bugs program or a bugs program to do everything I'm doing today are these whatever number of lines there are with the input and output. And maybe we can come back, but the point I want to make by this is not so much teaching about wind bugs programming or Marta Collar programming, it's just to say this CPU does a lot of hard work once we've done a reasonably straightforward specification of the model. So going back to that picture for a minute, here is the point estimates ordered with their exact confidence intervals. And this is the kind of picture that comes up when you're doing something that's empirical Bayesian or Bayesian, and even if you don't ever want to be such a beast, if you kind of like these pictures, it's not bad. So what does this picture have? The center line here are these MLEs, just like the dots and the other thing. 